Hello and welcome to a talk about Tor. This time we are going to talk about anonymity loves diversity and why this is a thing which is mattering for Tor. Um, we have prepared um, talking about different parts of Tor and uh, how diversity plays a role in them. But before we are going to do so, we'll start with a short introduction about ourselves and um, about what, what this Tor thing is for those of you who haven't heard of it before. I'm Georg. I've been volunteering for Tor since 2010 and became what is called a core Tor developer in 2013. I was mainly working on uh, Tor browser and the Tor button and uh, reproducible builds efforts. Eventually I started leading the Tor browser team in 2016 and recently moved on to uh, so-called network health work. My name is Alex. I'm also a core developer with the Tor project. I've only been around since 2017, where I started working full-time on Tor. I'm heading up Tor's network team, which is a team responsible for the Tor software, not the browser, but the little program that is responsible for talking with the network. I've been a free software developer since 2006. I've maintained um, a variety of small utilities. I think the most known one is the ERC IRC client. Prior to Tor, I was working with various distributed systems written in primarily the Erlang programming language. And I've also done WebKit-based browsers for the Qt WebKit team at Nokia, which was the team responsible for also delivering the web browser for the N9 handsets, which was the um, Amigo phone that Nokia developed a couple of years ago. In my spare time, I'm doing the annual Bornhack Hacker Festival in Denmark. So if you're looking for a good hacker festival, once we're done with this pandemic, you should definitely check out bornhack.dk for more information about that. The first thing we're going to look at is what is Tor? Tor is an online anonymity and censorship circumvention tool set. We develop a browser which bundles a number of different smaller utilities, such as the actual Tor software, which is the software that speaks with the, with the network. Everything we do is free software. It's available for people to look at, inspect, figure out how it works, help solve bugs, all these kind of things. We generally develop it as a free software project. One of the big things we're going to talk about in this presentation is the Tor network. It's an open network, meaning that everybody who wants to participate can participate in it. Additionally, Tor is also a pretty big community of researchers, developers, users, and also relay operators. The relay operators are the human beings or organizations that are running these different uh, nodes in this open network. We are registered as a 501c3 in the US, which means that we are a nonprofit with some um, tax deduction possibilities if you do donations and you are based in the US. If we start by taking a bit of a look at the history of Tor, if we go back to the early 2000s, uh, Tor back then was mostly Nick Matthewson and Roger Dingledine, who was working together with the U.S. Naval Research Laboratories on getting Tor to work and, and getting the first versions out. In 2004, the EFF sponsored Tor, sort of um, with the ability to start taking donations and so on. In 2006, Tor incorporated and became a nonprofit. In 2008, the Tor browser development began. Before that, you would have to take a browser and um, make it use Tor using Privoxy or some other tool to uh, establish connection to a SOX proxy. This is something Georg is going to talk a bit about later when we talk about application development. In 2010, the Arab Spring happened, which was a time where a lot more people became aware of what Tor was and what Tor could provide for people. In 2013 was the summer of the Snowden revelations where we learned about the NSA mass surveillance and Snowden also talked a bit about Tor back then. In 2018, a dedicated anti-censorship team was created in Tor to help with uh, developing new tools and new strategies for how to circumvent censorship in various parts of the world. In 2019, we shipped the Tor browser for Android. This was a pretty big uh, milestone. Tor has historically been mostly developing tools for uh, Linux, Mac and Windows and for, for desktop in general, but having a mobile browser was important because more and more people are starting to use their mobile devices as the primary devices. 
In 2020, we created the Network Health Team, which Georg is going to expand a bit upon later. The Network Health Team is responsible for monitoring the Tor network, sort of how well it's doing, and is there any issues with it? Is there something we need to quickly look into, and so on. In this photo, you can see some subset of the Tor community who is gathered at a developer meeting that we have usually twice a year when we're allowed to travel. We haven't had any this year because of the pandemic. We collaborate in Tor with a large amount of different organizations. Of course, we collaborate with Mozilla, who's developing the uh, Firefox browser, which is what Tor browser is based upon. But we also have some very good friends at the Guardian Project, which is working on um, mobile security tools for both Android and iOS. We work with Uni, which is responsible for doing a lot of monitoring of internet censorship all over the world. We have a project uh, that we collaborate with called the Library of Freedom Project, which is doing um, training of people to the point where they're able to train other people in digital safety, mostly with uh, librarians in the North America. One interesting part of developing anonymity tools that is slightly different from other software that we would develop is that we can't really measure how many users we have. We have some estimates from some different research papers that says that we have somewhere between two and eight million daily users. If you were doing software like normally where you are in an organization, you would add a lot of instrumentation into the software where you're able to measure how many users, what they do, which uh, views they're uh, focused on for how long time they're doing it. Same thing with social media today. People are looking at various indicators for how their performance are doing. Because we build anonymity systems, we can't really add these kind of metrics into our softwares. We can't really track and say we have exactly this amount of users. So we'll have to live with some kind of estimates from the different research communities that we collaborate with. The first thing we're going to do is to sort of build up a mental model of how the Tor network works. Before we do that, we're going to give an example on how, for example, a single relay system will work. This is incredibly similar to how a VPN provider works. It might be you have a VPN provider privately that you pay for, or it might be your company is providing a VPN system for you. In a VPN scenario, you will usually have a number of using a number of users using as a single relay in the system. This is the VPN server. What they will be doing is that they are usually encrypting the traffic to the VPN host, and then the VPN host decrypts the traffic and sends it out at the internet. This protects sort of the user's uh, transit of data between the user itself and to the VPN provider. One of the things here is that you rely very heavily on the intents of the provider. If the provider is, for example, malicious, or it might also be that they've made some administrative um, mess ups where they, for example, are storing locks and they're able to ship locks to other providers, even though they claim not to be doing it, this could be a problem. But it doesn't just have to be that the organization that is providing the VPN is malicious or have some other problems. It gives us one big problem, which is that it's a single point of failure. So you only have to attack a single node or a single set of nodes um, to gather information about a lot of users from this system. And additionally, because most users are sending their traffic over a single host, it would be pretty easy for an adversary to do timing analysis and bridge sort of the incoming traffic that is encrypted with the outgoing traffic, which might not be encrypted, and figure out which user is responsible for which outgoing connections of the system. If we instead take a look at how the Tor design is, in this case, we zoom in on Alice and Bob, which is the Alice is trying to make a connection to Bob. What we do now is that instead of having a single node, we add a whole network of nodes, which is what we call the anonymity network, or in this case, the Tor network. The idea is that we add several relays so that no single relay can betray neither Alice nor Bob. So the first thing Alice does here, which is an important thing to understand, is that Alice decides which path through the network that she wants to take. Alice has, through the directory system we have in Tor, an idea about every node that is available to her in the Tor network. From this, she has access to their encryption keys and thus knows what the keys are up front before she tries to connect to them. Alice decides the path, and the first thing Alice does here 
is that she establishes a secure session with the first relay, we call it R1. She then tells R1 to establish a connection to R2 and does so in an end-to-end -end encrypted manner where there's both authenticated and also encrypted traffic between it. Alice will then continue to ask R2 to extend what we call the circuit over to R3. And finally, she will tell R3 to connect to Bob. She now has an encrypted connection from herself to R1, via R1 an encrypted session to R2, and via R2 an encrypted session to R3. And now she can finally establish the TCP connection to Bob. If we take a bit of a look at how this works from the different adversary scenarios we can think of, Bob will be able to see that there's traffic coming from R3, how much traffic that's flowing and so on. R3 will be able to see that there's traffic coming from R2. R2 will be able to see how much traffic that's coming from R1 and R1 will know um, that there is traffic coming from Alice and that it's connecting to R2. But what is important here is that we can see that only R3 knows about Bob. R2 and R1 does not know about Bob, which is the endpoint that Alice is trying to connect to. This means that the multiple hops on the system here, that they will have to cooperate to be able to betray Alice. And that should give us both some anonymity prop properties, but also some more security against various other observation techniques that can happen. It's important in this whole thing to understand that the anonymity properties doesn't just come from encryption. We have to have this multi-hop system to gain the anonymity properties. If we take an example where we have Alice and Bob having a direct connection, which is end-to-end -end encrypted over, for example, the TLS protocol, what happens here is that the encryption protects the content. Usually we combine encryption with authentication so that an adversary cannot actively go in and modify the traffic. But if we have an adversary that is eavesdropping on the traffic between Alice and Bob, like in this case, what they would see is basically gibberish. But one thing they will see that is important to understand is that they see that there is traffic flowing between Alice and Bob. And additionally, they get, they get information such as uh, when did this session begin, when did this session end, how much data was transferred, how much data was received from both ends, which um, TCP ports are they using to connect to, and so on. This data is what we call metadata, and it's metadata that we try to protect in the Tor network so that you cannot collect metadata from the users that are part of it. And one of the reasons we do this is because of this guy. This is Michael Hayden. He's the former director of the NSA and the CIA, and he very openly in an interview a couple of years ago said that the US state kills people based on metadata. One part we won't be talking that much about in this presentation is our bridge system, but it still deserves a bit of a mention. Since some of the Tor users are in censored areas and because the Tor network is an open and public network, as I described earlier, when Alice is establishing the connection through the network, she knows every single node that is in the network. That means that it's trivial for an adversary who wants to block access to the Tor network to simply fetch a list of all the nodes in the network and then block all the IP addresses. And this is something we do see happen. What we have done then is that we've built an abstraction on top of this that we call the bridge system. In parallel to the Tor network, there is a more closed, it's a, a hidden network sort of to say, which is used to contain Tor relays that are used as entry points into the Tor network. But since these nodes are not listed in the directory documents, they are not as easy to censor. We then have various software to distribute it out to the users. This could be via email, it can be via uh, various web services that we have different system for accessing even in, in centered areas. If we, um, if we take a look at how it works, one thing here is that we have Alice who's in a centered area. Alice is trying to connect to a bridge over the Tor protocol. One issue that could be here is that the attacker is able to identify at the edge between the centered area and to the bridge that Alice is communicating over the Tor protocol. This means that if you do DPI and so on, and you're able to say, given this connection, this is probably a Tor connection, then Alice will, mo will most likely have her access to the bridge blocked, and eventually the bridge will be uh, 
blocked entirely for other uses as well. To deal with this issue, we came up with a system called Plockable Transports. This is again a small abstraction where you can have your Tor client use a Plockable Transport client to connect to a Plockable Transport server, which is then connected to an actual Tor uh, daemon, which is giving access to the network. But using this PT system, you have you are able to use an obfuscated protocol instead of using just the Tor protocol itself. This have a number of pretty nice properties. It allows people to build an experiment and deploy these obfuscation technologies uh, without having to modify Tor itself. Tor is a uh, C code base. It's uh, pretty complicated. It uh, requires a bit of time for us to do code review and so on. So having a faster paced environment to build an experiment with this anti-censorship technology is pretty critical. And the pluggable transports um, helps with that. A cool thing about it is that it's an open system. We have a specification for it. We work with other vendors on it. And there are different VPN providers and so on that also support using uh, pluggable transport together with their systems. It's important for this pluggable transport system to have a diverse set of tools that works with it and that we can use in different scenarios. For example, it might be that one of them has a weakness, then it's important that we have other tools that works for different kind of people or in different scenarios. One of them that we haven't used right now is called the Obfuscator or Ops4. What it does is that it makes it more difficult for passive DPI to verify the presence of the Ops4 protocol as mentioned in one of the previous slides around bridges, it's possible for an adversary to see that a given connection is a Tor connection and thus shut it down. Another thing an adversary could do would be to try to connect to what it thinks is a Tor relay and try to speak a bit of the Tor protocol. If the uh, bridge responds with something that is the Tor protocol, it knows that this is a Tor connection. Ops4 protects against this by having a shared secret between the, uh, the client and the user that the adversary has to know as well. This makes active probing very difficult. It uses um, encryption, it uses the NTOR handshake from TOR, which is an X25519 based handshake, but it does some tricks to make the elliptic curve points indistinguishable from uniform random strings. Additionally, we have a system called Meek. Meek is using what is called domain fronting via HTTP. Domain fronting is very basically where the client makes a connection into one of the big public uh, cloud system. In this example, it uses Azure. What it does is that it seems to be connecting to a site that a sensor would have no interest in blocking, such as a big CDN site for some JavaScript code, for example. What it does is that a, an adversary monitoring Alice will see that Alice is doing a DNS lookup for Ajax, ASP.NET, CDN.com. And immediately after she receives the response, she's making a TLS connection into this cloud. And in the SNI header of the TLS connection, she requests Ajax, ASP.NET, CDN.com. But inside of the HTTP header, she will request a different host and many of these public clouds have different load balancers at the edge, and they will happily send you over to a, a different customer in the system where we are operating a, a bridge for, to access the Tor network. This is a very nice system. It's a bit expensive because we have to pay for all the traffic in and out of the clouds. And additionally, some of the cloud providers really don't like us uh, that we are, we are doing this kind of stuff. So to try to mitigate that a bit, we've built a system that uses less traffic. It's called Snowflake. The way Snowflake works is that we have a Snowflake broker, which is um, also in a public cloud, but is used for Alice. Alice connects to the Snowflake broker, also using um, this SNI trick and with domain fronting. But in this time, she doesn't have to send all her traffic via the public cloud. What she instead uses the broker for is to uh, find a WebRTC client out on the internet IP space that is uncensored. Alice is now able to make a WebRTC connection between herself in the censored area and this client, which is running in some person's web browser as a web extension out on the internet. 
and using this web browser as sort of a bouncing point, she's able to establish a connection to a Snowflake PT server over a WebSocket connection. This has the benefit that we're exchanging very little traffic over the cloud provider. And the game we are playing here is that um, we hope that the adversaries is not interested in blocking the entire IP space where people are usually having their laptops and their phones and thus where these Snowflake clients exist. We're finally at the point where we can start talking about the Torn network. As mentioned earlier, it's an open network. It means that every, everybody can join it. Um, the only thing you need access to is that you need a, a pretty stable internet connection, um, ideally in some data center where you can run a, an operating system with the Tor software on. We have something between 6,000 and 7,000 nodes in the network. All of these nodes are provided by different individuals. Some are provided by companies who support the Tor cause or also different nonprofit organizations that set up um, set up these organizations in their respective countries where they can get legal advice and so on. An important thing from the security of the Tor system is that we have a diverse set of these nodes called the directory authorities. We have nine directory authorities and then we have a special directory authority which is purely focused on the bridge system. The directory authorities' responsibility and uh, abilities is that they are able to decide which nodes um, are in the Tor network and which nodes are going to be kicked out. If, for example, we detect that they are um, doing something to the traffic, they're monitoring it, they're modifying traffic and so on. Georg is going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, these nodes are critical to the security of the system and they are run by trusted individuals that have been in the Tor community for a long time. They are hosted in different parts of the world. We have some in Europe. We even have one in Sweden, uh, we have some in the US and so on. The security of the majority of these nodes are, are pretty important to uphold and the safety of the system very much depends on these nodes being safe. If we take a bit of a look at the amount of bandwidth that exists in this network, we have two different things we have to look at. We have the advertised bandwidth and we have what is called the bandwidth history. The advertised bandwidth is the sum of how much bandwidth each relay think it has. And the bandwidth history is how much traffic that has been flowing through the, the network. If we take a look at, at the chart here, we can see that the traffic is generally growing. We have around somewhere between 500 and 600 gigabits of traffic available in the Tor network right now. And we're utilizing somewhere between 200 and 300 gigabits. If you look at the top curve between 2019 and 2020, you would see there is a pretty steep uh, spike in there. This was some researchers who were doing an experiment to see how much traffic is actually available in the network where they were trying to push some of the relays to their limits so that they were able to see how much traffic that are actually available in it. And we can see that we're slowly getting towards that step. If we look at the total number of relays and also the total number of bridges in the network, we can see that we have somewhere between 6,000 and 7,000, as mentioned earlier before. It's pretty stable right now. We're not getting that many more um, the amount of bridges also seems to be pretty stable. Um, and fortunately, it seems like they are growing in capacity in terms of network. But if you're interested in running a relay, we're of course always interested to getting more relays. It's important to understand that the safety of the Tor network comes from its diversity. One of the things is the diversity of the relays. The more relays we have, the more diverse they are, the fewer attackers in a position to do traffic confirmation. And diversity here means everything from which person is running it, which country they are, which AS number they are in, which operating system they are on, even down to which point release of the Tor release they are running. It's also important for the Tor network that we have diversity of the users and reasons and different reasons to use it. Georg is going to return to that later when he talks a bit about the applications of Tor. But one example here is that we have 50,000 users in, for example, Iran. It means that almost all of them are normal citizens and most likely not bots or anything like that. 
One uh, problem we do have is that we have an open research problem, which is how do we measure this diversity in the network over time? One example of a place where we are not doing so well on diversity is the relay platforms. This is something we store in our metric system, so we have data about it historically. If we take a bit of a look at uh, the plot here, you will see that we have around 6,000 nodes, which is running on the Linux system. Historically, there has been a bit of a connection between the Debian project and Tor. So we believe that a large fraction of these Linux nodes are running either Debian or Ubuntu or some other Debian-based um, uh, distribution. One interesting thing we can say uh, about this plot additionally is that if we look around the change from 2015 to 16 is that the BSD relays are slowly taking over the number of Windows relays. We are generally not an organization that are very good with Windows on the server side of things. So that is definitely lacking behind also uh, some parts of it is, is our own fault. But it's really good to see that the BSD community is also picking up on uh, on Tor in general and are helping to provide uh, Tor relay hosting. Another place where the diversity could be better in the Tor network is the number of countries that we're in and how big the clusters are in the respective countries. If we take a look at this top 10 list of where which countries that have the most relays, we can see that uh, Germany have 1,500, the US have 1,100, France have almost 700 um, relays in their countries, which means that it's, uh, it's very much centralized around some, a very few number of, of countries. I thought it was a bit interesting to see Sweden was in the top 10 here. I think that's really awesome. Even though this is a virtual conference, I thought it would be fun to sort of highlight uh, Sweden together with Norway and Denmark in this case. Uh, where Sweden is doing uh, vastly better than Norway and, and much better than Denmark. I think if I remember correctly, then Finland is number 11 on, on this list, if we, um, if we have that included. If we try to, um, to plot this on a world map, you can see how it looks here. It's very much centralized around the US and Central Europe. Um, this chart doesn't say that much because it's so centralized, but if we remove the top three, that is um, Germany and uh, the US and France, it will instead look like this. You can see that there are areas of the world where we generally don't have many relays running. We don't have nodes running in a large part of the African continent. There are parts of Latin America uh, where we are not running relays, Antarctica, of course, uh, Greenland as well. Um, we are, the relays are generally placed in areas where there is the least chance, of course, of them getting blocked. So it doesn't make sense, for example, to run a relay in Iran when there's already censorship going on in, in this country. If we, um, if we take a look at the networks there, and if you remember back at one of the earlier slides where I was talking about how Alice decides which path through the network that she's going to pick uh, amongst these three nodes, this algorithm for path selection has a number of settings that you can tune. For example, you're able to say, I want to have a path where I exit in Russia or where I exit in Germany. This can be useful if you're using the Tor network to, for example, test if a website works probably from Germany or from Russia, or from some other place in the world. By default, one of the uh, properties that the default path selection have in Tor is that it refuses to add two nodes to the same path, which is within the same slash 16 network of uh, the IPv4 address space. So if we try to group the number of relays we have per slash 16 on the IP space, we can see that there is a number of them that have a very large number of relays as well, but it's still better than at the country level. We can, for example, see at uh, um, 185.220 slash 16 that we have 216 relays in that network. If we move on and look at the AS number instead, we can see that OVH in France, which is a, a reasonably cheap um, hosting provider where you can buy both physical and uh, VPS nodes, um, have around 770 nodes in the network. 
Hetzner, which is a, a big German, also pretty cheap provider, um, has 400 nodes in their network and so on. One thing that's interesting here is that some of the networks that exist operates in with different um, with different AS numbers. For example, I believe that uh, Linode and DigitalOcean, they are available in many zones also outside of Europe and outside of the US, so they have different AS numbers for these kind of things. Next up, Georg wants to talk a bit about how we in the Tor project handle malicious relays in the Tor network. As we've seen on the previous slides, having a low barrier for entering the Tor network is great for diversity. But on the other hand, it invites malicious actors as well to join the Tor network and mess with the user's traffic or even de-anonymize them. So what are we doing and what are we planning to do against those? I have um, put two scenarios on the slide which we are concerned with. So the scenario one is you have a malicious operator which is running a bunch of relays and trying to get them both in the guard and exit position and um, essentially de-anonymize users because they know where you are connecting from and, and then they, they know where people are heading to and they can easily correlate th those things, at least in theory and try and, and try to um, figure out what you are up to so that's that's bad news to prevent this we try to pin guard relays that means once you start your application towards picking a set of guard relays and uh, sticking to them for for a long time like weeks and months making sure that um, the risk is uh, the risk that you are actually picking a bad one and landing in this situation um, is pretty low and on the other hand we try to convince relay operators that they should set the so-called my family setting in their tor configuration file indicating that a set of relays is belonging to the same family which in turn allows tor to avoid those relays being in the same path when tor selecting the path through the network but that's just one scenario we're concerned with um, a more likely scenario is that uh, a malicious actor is setting up exit relays and trying to um, snoop on user's traffic or manipulate even uh, user traffic, for instance, by rewriting Bitcoin addresses, trying to steal Bitcoin. So what are we doing against those? We have a set of tools um, which, is, uh, which is scanning exit relays, pretending to be legitimate, for instance, Tor browser users, and um, trying to attack attacks like uh, SSS strip attacks, where attackers would um, strip off the SSL protection and rewrite the, for instance, the Bitcoin address on an HTTP website and then try to steal the money. This is working kind of. It, it's pretty hard to write good scanners because as soon as you um, just scan for website X being modified and the attacker is modifying instead website Y. Um, your scanner is not detecting uh, this attack. So given there are some billion websites out there, it's pretty hard to scan uh, for this correctly and, and find all those mal malicious as stripping attacks. But if, uh, but once we find those, um, we swiftly blacklist um, those found relays and and, their, and the families behind this if there's a family behind this but there's uh, overall an uphill battle so we need uh, desperately need to change the arms race because we can't keep up with, with that one what can we do instead so there are at least two areas we can improve here one is application level improvements that means we configure for instance Tor browser in a way that it's only requesting HTTPS protected websites and is preventing downgrading to HTTP only or HTTP websites. And there are two ways for this. Um, once, uh, one way is to use built-in functionality of HTTPS Everywhere, an extension we already ship in Tor Browser, which can be configured to only allow HTTPS requests. And the other one is um, recently uh, Firefox got a feature called HTTPS only mode, um, which Mozilla is still testing and refining, and we could 
backport uh, a bunch of patches and ship, the, ship those into a browser, which has the benefit that the usability is is, is better than in the uh, HTTPS Everywhere case. And this is an important point um, we must not forget because there are likely still a ton of HTTP only websites out there and um, there's a big risk that breakage for for users in, in this scenario um, leads them to using a different browser which is less secure and less safe. The Tor browser is um, essentially making it worse for those users. Um, but apart from those application level improvements, there's um, the general idea of just limiting the influence of, of realists we don't know anything about when, uh, when Tor is picking a path through the network. What what no here means is is to be decided, but it could be a thing like a web of trust um, where some folks in the com community know those operators and can kind of vouch for them. And um, if, if we know them, they get just more of the traffic than uh, they would get otherwise. And we try to decide what good thresholds you are and where we should draw the line and, and make the uh, necessary changes and how, how they would look like um, overall in particular if there are different goals to consider not just the bad relay uh, um, protection but as well our scalability and performance improvement plans so there are some trade-offs to make um, we are currently in the process of um, of nailing down the plan and then think about prototyping things to make um, this arms race change in a way that we can actually can actually win it and not just um, be able to uh, uh, to act after the fact as we are doing now. I think it's fair to say that most of our users come in contact with uh, Tor through one or the other applications um, in the first place. But how do we actually sell the different properties Tor provides to different user groups? If you are talking to private citizens, it's pretty easy to say, hey, you should use Tor because Tor provides um, privacy on the internet. It helps safeguarding your privacy on the internet. But that might not be as appealing to, say, human rights activists who might mainly be motivated to reach websites they care about, like Facebook or news websites like The Guardian or BBC to inform themselves about things happening in their home country where they are censored. If you're talking to businesses, on the other hand, then they might not really care about privacy on the internet or reachability, even, even though they should. But they are much more interested in uh, Tor helping them with their network security to keep their assets safe. If you're talking to governments, they are foremost interested in what is called traffic analysis resistance, which given their opponents like nation states and the resources they have is quite a reasonable goal. So having all those different user groups, why do we actually care that all of them are port uh, are part of the Tor network. What is actually um, the goal behind that? There are a bunch of reasons why you want to have a lot of diverse users on the Tor network. First one is that having a diverse user group is helping against singling out individual users. Um, you can think of it that way. If you already know that only government officials are using the Tor network. You already have narrowed down the potential user you are looking for considerably compared to uh, millions of users uh, with different backgrounds, being in different countries, uh, being online at different times, and so on. But there's a tension here, right? Because all those different users we want to have connect to the Tor network with their own devices um, and their own operating systems which 
and nowadays at least leak a ton of information in particular if um, if they are using a complicated tool like a browser um, how do we how do we prevent users from getting singled out that way um, so we have developed in the past and are still developing um, an own browser which is called Tor browser which is helping against that problem so there are different strategies we could do here one of the stra strategies is um, which we actually do is trying to make uses of Tor browser as uniform as possible that means um, while we still try to provide um, the best browsing experience as other browsers do as well we go at great length and uh, trying to make users uniform for instance we try to avoid things like leaking your screen resolution or um, users being tracked across websites with tracking cookies or leaking your language you have pre-configured on your desktop or in your Tor browser and so on so that's one way to deal with that problem making users uniform the other way is basically spoiling fingerprinting efforts by just um, returning random values or spoof values making it essentially an unusable means of singling individual users out but it's a problem which is not only a thing in the browser space but generally an application layer issue which one has to take uh, to, to care about but there's more I think we need as well a diverse set of users with diverse backgrounds to get our basic usability privacy and security properties right if we optimize only for one user group uh, with one set of goals and one threat model there's the high risk that we uh, endanger other users and other user groups because um, they might interact with the uh, applications like Tor browser um, in a way that is not taken into account when we designing it so then they might make mistakes or just um, use it use the application in a way which was not in our mindset and thus this is pretty dangerous if we stick to the browser for a while what we've been doing in the past is doing trainings all over the world and we're still doing them to gather all those different use cases and goals and threat models out there and feed them directly into the Tor browser development back. This has resulted in a significant improvement in, uh, in usability and thus privacy protections and security guarantees. If you look at the screenshot I've put on the slide, for instance, as an example, you see in the upper right corner um, two icons. One is the shield icon, which is showing you easily the security level you are on and if you click on it it gives you access to choose a different one if you wish to do so and the broom icon is meant to give you a new clean tour session if if the need arises and it's just one click away while it's been previously buried in some sub menus which was clearly not optimal and if you want to know something about your current tour usage you can uh, easily click on the lock icon and your current tour circuit is shown and there are ways to request new ones if the, if the need should arise but there are clearly downsides to diversity as well which we should talk about in this context too so with users with diverse backgrounds and um, different behaviors entering the tour network you are eventually getting jerks on it as well this is hardly surprising right but the consequences of that are pretty severe so 
how does this look like? This looks like um, users getting blocked from reaching their destinations. For instance, if you're using Tor Browser, you are not allowed to enter websites anymore, or you're getting captures you have to solve. And even that is not really helping sometimes. This is problematic um, because, I mean, if you are a normal user, a prospective user, or even a normal Tor user, and you're trying to enter um, the Swedish Railroad Company's website, looking up timetables or buying tickets, and you're getting free with the website I put on the slide saying, hey, you're not allowed because of your unauthorized behavior, then this is in the first place ridiculous and, and then highly confusing because, I mean, you, you just entered the uh, domain name and hit enter and that's it. There was no behavior like doing weird queries or messing with the website or, or something like that. So. What you probably think is, oh, this tour thing is, is broken. It's not really usable. Let's do something else like firing up Chrome and moving on with our lives, which is understandable, as I said. Um, but this is problematic um, for at least two reasons. The first one is it weakens the overall guarantees Tor is providing to all of its users because if you're jumping off the tour train and other users as well, then this weakens the cover for the remaining ones against getting singled out by adversaries. And secondly, it could even have consequences for you personally too, depending on your, uh, depending on where you're living and, and the context you're living in. Because if you are picking up a tool which is less sophisticated um, in safeguarding your privacy and security online, this could, this could essentially endanger yourself. So we have to solve um, this problem somehow. And um, how we do this, we will examine on the next slide. So how do we solve this tour blocking problem? Um, you may see all of those question marks already on the slide, right? So this should indicate that uh, we don't have a silver bullet in sight, unfortunately. There are different tools we have in our toolbox. Both been using, uh, we have both been using them in the past, uh, in, the, in the present, and thinking about them for the future. Um, this might help, you see, it's not sure yet. So what we've been doing uh, traditionally is been reaching out to websites and trying to convince them that Tor users are overall a positive thing to have, which was kind of a mixed success. Um, some website owners dropped Tor blocks. Um, some were not convinced and even if they would have been, there's the risk that you would st start seeing blocks again like a week later when they changed their mind. Um, and you would start from uh, square zero again, which is overall a thing which is not scaling. In particular, if you look at the billions of websites out there and uh, the constant monitoring you would have to do and, and then contacting all the website owners who are blocking tour. This is really not a good solution, uh, if it's a solution at all. So we have to do something about the core problem that we have uh, jerks on the Tor network, which is particularly hard in the Tor context because Tor aims um, to provide anonymity for, for essentially all of its users, not just for the non-jerk ones. And uh, apart from the problem that uh, there is no clear definition of what is a jerk and what not. So what can we do? We have been thinking about um, kind of proof of work schemes, solving small puzzles to, um, to, to, to show that you spend some effort here and, uh, and this could allow you accessing onion services, for instance, or um, other things. Um, this has been mainly developed as a proposal 327 in the context of solving the problem for denial of service against our onion services or against onion services. But it could have in other parts as well. Then uh, uh, more sophisticated things could uh, include anonymous uh, credentials like privacy pass, where we would um, uh, issue tokens to users and, and then those tokens can get um, exchange uh, against access to services later on. Um, another thing we recently uh, 
thought about was allowing paid access relays where we would um, make sure that uh, those exits or the operators of those exits would make sure that the, the IP reputation would stay high, um, which is usually um, the indicator of uh, getting blocked or not blocked. Like low IP reputation would mean you're getting easier blocked by by services than having a high IP reputation. So paid exit um, operators would uh, get get some kind of yeah, payment, and in return would make sure that the those exit relays would be ones with high reputation and those less likely to get blocked. Um, those are the things we are currently thinking about. As I said, we'll see how, how this goes uh, uh, in the long run, whether we deploy any of that at all or whether there is something that we better we come up with. It's, it's a tough problem we have to solve. We are slowly getting to the end of this presentation. We, are, we hope that you have gotten an idea about what Tor is, why the different diversity properties matter to the Tor system, where we can do better. If you're sitting at home and is thinking, how can I help uh, the Tor project in various ways? We have a number of things you can do. For example, you can, if you're a software person, you can start hacking on some of the cool projects we have. You can help us find and potentially even fix some of the bugs that we have in the software. The software we write is by no means perfect. If you run Tor on some interesting platform that might not be uh, what we used uh, normally, then helping testing Tor on, on this platform would be of great benefit to us. If you are more into research stuff, you can work on some of the different open research projects that exist. There is a pretty big community of uh, privacy researchers that are gathering together in some, I think there are annual, annual meetings called uh, PETS, where there is a lot of papers about uh, Tor presented. You can, if you have access to server hosting and bandwidth and a server, that um, you can run a Tor relay or a bridge and you can also go out and teach other people about Tor and privacy in general. Another important way that you can help is to donate to the Tor project. If you go to donate.torproject.org, we are running our end of the year campaign for 2020 right now. We are very happy to receive the donations. Donation money is excellent for us because the donation money that we get can be spent on things that we think is important. A lot of the development we do is grant-based where we write a proposal, then we go through a number of iteration of those, and then we get a final approval, and then we have a list of objectives that we have to go through and do the development for that. With donation money, we are able to look at things that are, for example, an emergency situation where we have a problem with the network that we would like to do something about, and the donation money allows us to spend developer hours on these things. So please check out donate.torproject.org. If you donate enough, you will be able to get a t-shirt or some other different kind of Tor branded swag. We are at the end of this presentation. We hope you have enjoyed it. We do have time for a couple of questions, we believe. So let's have a look at those.